Dear Emerson, to be a bat mitzvah at Temple Micah takes a lot of work. We have just seen much of that work, but there's one piece that's remaining, one piece to add to all your thought, to all your work, to your beautiful voice, and that's your curiosity, your thought. So you have, in Temple Micah tradition, asked me a question, which I will now answer in this letter. You asked me, in America, in this moment where anti-Semitism is mostly nonviolent and not as widespread, how can we learn to draw the line on what is anti-Semitism and what isn't? And how can we call it out without feeling like we're ruining a peace that is happening? So your question, how do we know what is and what isn't anti-Semitism? And how do we know if and when we should call it out? And what should we do? Emerson, we first have to begin as you do in your question. We have to acknowledge that still, with everything going on, which I'll get to in a moment, it is one of the safest times in history to be a Jew, especially here in America. Even as we feel scared, it's important to say that this is not the destruction of the temple, this is not the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisitions, the pogroms, or the Holocaust. And yet, anti-Semitic events in this country are being reported at huge rates. And Emerson, there are still all the incidents daily that go unreported. The swastika scraped into the, the bathroom stall, the comment from a classmate who learned it from her parents, the protest sign which says, by any means necessary. The cartoon which portrays a Jew pulling the strings. Statements that blame the collectivity of the Jewish people for the actions of a single government. And intimations that Jewish money or power or Zionists run the world. Jews on college campuses barred from student government being accused of having dual allegiances between America and Israel, marches with chants like Jews will not replace us or globalize the intifada, Jewish students requiring police escort, fearing for their actual safety. And of course, there are the worst instances, bomb threats and broken windows and attacks on Jewish institutions and synagogues and real violence what all of them have in common is that they're meant to make us feel that our safety is contingent on others' whims. That even though it's not 1938 in Germany, not the pogroms of 19th century Russia, it's meant to make us feel that we can't ever really be sure if we're okay. So part of the anxiety that you ask about Emerson, when do we know if it's really anti-Semitism reflects the nature of anti-Semitism itself. Historian Richard Levy says this, anti-Semitism appears, either withers or thrives, but seems never wholly to disappear from the modern world. The conditions of Jewish life that once called forth hostility may have altered dramatically, yet anti-Semitism seems to have a life of its own impervious to objective reality. Time and again, it has risen to the surface, demonstrating its capacity to move sizable groups of people to an active of innately destructive nature. Deborah Lipstadt, the US Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, asks us this, to imagine that someone has done something you find objectionable. You may legitimately resent the person because of his or her actions or attitudes, but if you resent him even an iota more because that person is Jewish, that is anti-Semitism. So that's one way to understand it. Another is, as historical sociologist Helen Fine suggests, 
a persisting latent structure of hostile beliefs towards Jews as a collectivity, which translates then into attitudes, culture, and actions, which results in and or is designed to distance, displace, or destroy Jews as Jews. And those definitions are helpful for your question, Emerson. When you wonder about the actions or beliefs of others that seem hostile towards you or towards Jews, can you tell if it's intentional or perhaps just ignorance? Because not everything is anti-Semitism. Sometimes even people saying unintelligent things about Jews or Israel might not be anti-Semitism. And yet this is harder than ever. Every day now, we hear people using anti-Jewish tropes to describe Israel or Israelis, using the word Zionist as code for Jew or Israeli or Zionist entity rather than Israel. Every day we hear of people denying the record of Jewish history, denying the humanity of Israelis. We hear people making the error of assuming that the Israeli government speaks for all Jews, demanding that Jews disavow Israel or Zionism as a result. All of those things are anti-Semitism, according to Rabbi Jill Jacobs, CEO of Trua. All are built on that persistent, hostile belief that treats Jews as a nefarious collectivity in order to do us existential and physical damage. So when you wonder where to draw the line you ask about, ask yourself, does this seem to reflect a persistent, hostile belief about Jews? Does it lump us together as an evil collective, uniquely deserving of special anger? Does it cause fear or an actual reduction of safety for Jews? So that's a good place to start. But at the same time, Deborah Lipstadt reminds us, we also have to acknowledge that it is hard if not impossible, to explain something that is essentially irrational, delusional, and absurd. That is how it is supposed to work. Anti-Semitism is supposed to seem absurd to you. It's supposed to make you doubt yourself. It is irrational. It doesn't make sense. And so, Emerson, this is why we study our history. Because when we've seen something before, we are more likely to recognize it in our time. This is why Richard Levy, that historian, says knowledge of its history, knowledge of the history of anti-Semitism is the only weapon, a fragile weapon, he says, but it is our only weapon against anti-Semitism. So yes, looking at history is a very Jewish answer, but for good reason. We learn to know what anti-Semitism is by looking at our history, at our stories. And we do this not to uncover the rocks to, and to find anti-Semitism everywhere, but to understand it. And Emerson, we don't just look at our history, we also look to each other. We talk to each other. Because when something is, by design, irrational and illogical, when something is meant to gaslight, we have to use each other to validate our real experiences. And when something is designed as a dog whistle, we need others whose ears are attuned to it. We need to be able to ask our friends and rabbis and community members, was this real? Did you hear that too? So Emerson, wherever you go, in your life, whatever city or campus or country, you have to find community. Because hatred like this thrives when it makes us feel isolated or question our own reality. And then we turn to the second half of your question. What do I do? And that's the more challenging piece. Are we supposed to tiptoe past the light sleeper that is anti-Semitism? Do we let it lie or do we call it out? And when? And how far do we push? Emerson, to be Jewish is an impossible, beautiful task. 
There are too many texts to read, too many layers and histories for any of us to know them all, too many questions to ask. And I'm sorry to say that one of these impossibilities is how to survive in a world that is tempted to hate you. And not everyone does. Your own family and mine is enough proof of that. That we can love each other and build strong bridges and make new families that show other people the beauty and the richness of our community and tradition. You and me, our lives, our very existence is proof that even when it feels that way, the entire world does not hate us. So find more of these people, Emerson. Find the people who will stand by your side with love and solidarity. Because I'm about to give you another impossible task, one that I wish I didn't have to. That when you see anti-Semitism, I have to urge you to call it out, to stand up to it, to not let it be okay to hate us. Don't let it be okay to not, in the words of the great post-Holocaust theologian Emil Fackenheim, turn powerlessness into a virtue. Do not let yourself become powerless because that's what anti-Semitism and its proponents want, for us to feel helpless. That when faced with accusations that we, accusations that we control the world, that we decide that we want to highlight all the ways we don't have power. Instead of using the power within each of us and within our resilient, strong community to stand up and to speak out because anti-Semitism is dangerous, because it's the theoretical core of the fuel of white nationalism, because it's the engine of fascist and anti-democratic ideologies, because it's the basis of terrorist ideology and action, because, as Rabbi Jill Jacobs again writes, like all forms of oppression, anti-Semitism keeps structures of power in place. So fighting anti-Semitism must be part of our struggle for freedom and justice for all people. That means also pushing our movements for justice to take up the fight against anti-Semitism. But also, because we don't deserve to be hated, and because it just isn't right, and it just isn't righteous, because we deserve justice too, because we can all have both, we can all fight for justice for all, because our job, our impossible job as Jews is to show everyone that we can all be better. Because in the words of Teddy Roosevelt, which I shared with you earlier this week, if given the choice between righteousness and peace, I choose righteousness. Why? Because a peace built on hate is not peace. So Emerson, your impossible task is to bring your Jewish self, all of you, to stand up wherever we can, to speak out in favor of righteousness, to not be quiet for the sake of maintaining that quiet, quiet powerless peace. I know it's scary, but you are brave, and you come from a tradition of the courageous people, those people who are resilient, those people who have survived, who have lifted up love and justice and hoped and hoped for the peace, the real peace that comes from righteousness. I know it's easier to stay quiet. I know it's easier to put your head down, but you can't. We can't. We need you. I wish you didn't have to do this at all, but I need you to know I'll be, we'll be standing right beside you whenever you do. And maybe someday this impossible task will have been completed in solidarity and hope. Your friend. Rabbi Crawley.